Hey everybody, today we're going to do a video about cytokines and the way we're going to divide this up is we're going to look at cytokines based on the two types of macrophages. So if you look here in the center of the diagram, you see a monocyte has come into the area and a monocyte can either turn into a type 1 macrophage or a type 2 macrophage. And a very gross um, oversimplification of how that will happen is if there's interferon gamma in the area, then it will become a type 1 macrophage and if there's interleukin-4 in the area, it's going to become a type 2 macrophage. And what's the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 macrophage? A type 1 macrophage is good at killing and is good at causing inflammation, whereas a type 2 macrophage is good at repair and anti-inflammatory activities. So the first video will be about the type 1 macrophage, and the second video will be about the type 2 macrophage. So let's take a look at the chart. So in the middle of the chart here, we have the type 1 macrophage, and we'll zoom in to the center and look at the inflammasome first. So in here, in the type 1 macrophage, we have the inflammasome, which is made up of the nod-like receptor, pyrin 3, and that is different than nod 3. This is nod 2. We don't actually have nod 3 on this diagram, but we do have uh, nod 2. If we had nod 3, that would be different from nod-like receptor pyrin 3. So in the inflammasome, other than the nod-like receptor pyrin 3, we also have capsase 1. And when those sense changes in calcium, cholesterol crystals, uric acid crystals, ATP, or free fatty acids, it's going to take precursor IL-1B and change it into the active form of IL, or not 1B, but 1-beta, into the active form of IL-1-beta. So you've got interleukin 1-beta being created by this inflammasome when it's activated in the type 1 macrophage. Also, the type 1 macrophage is going to be secreting interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. You also have some T helper cells that might secrete some tumor necrosis factor alpha, but this macrophage can do it all by itself. So tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1 beta all go to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will then secrete prostaglandin E2, which will activate neurotransmitters, which will activate fever. And so fever will cause microbes to slow down. It will cause phagocytes to speed up and work faster, and it will change the set point of your temperature in your body. So if we go back to the macrophage, we can look at some more things. Here at the top of the macrophage, there's a toll-like receptor 4. And if you remember, toll-like receptor number 4 is good at binding what? Lipopolysaccharides. Good job. Good job guessing. You can see the lipopolysaccharides here on the side of the bacteria. You've also got a FC gamma R1 receptor, and you've got IgG1 or IgG3 bound to this receptor. Now keep those in mind because in a little bit we're going to be going down here and looking at this B cell which is going to make a class switch from IgM to IgG1 or IgG3. And that's exactly what we have bound up here. So that B cell is helping out. It has bound to this bacteria which has allowed the macrophage to recognize it. It could have also bound to toll-like receptor 4 and it's also been opsonized by CRP and SAA. How did that happen? Well, the macrophage here secreted tumor necrosis alpha, tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which went to the liver, and the liver then secreted C-reactive protein and serum amyloid A, which opsonized the bacteria. CRP, C-reactive protein, can also join up with C1Q from the complement cascade and activate the classical complement system pathway. Normally, C1Q would require an antibody, but CRP can take the place of an antibody and activate the classical complement system. Nod-like receptor number two is also here on the type 1 macrophage, just because we need to know that Crohn's disease is related to nod, or sorry, not nod-like receptor, just nod two. And that's apparently one of the only nod receptors we need to know is nod two. So if we keep going, we can look over here to the right, and we'll see that the type 1 macrophage has secreted TGF-beta 
interleukin-6, and interleukin-23, and that will tell a na naive helper T cell to turn into a T17 cell, and that will start secreting interleukin-17. So T helper cell 17 secretes interleukin-17, and we apparently don't know a whole lot about interleukin-17, but we do know that it's good for inflammation and asking neutrophils to come help. So we'll move back over here to the macrophage, and it's talking to a T helper cell now. It's going to secrete interleukin-12. It's going to go into the T helper cell and activate STAT4. And we can also see that there's another STAT, STAT1, and that will be activated by something maybe the natural killer cell could secrete interferon gamma, or you might get interferon gamma from the macrophage coming down here. But interferon gamma will go into the cell, activate STAT4, which will activate T-BET inside the cell. The T helper cell also likes to secrete interleukin-2, which it will pick up itself. And this is a proliferation signal. So you can see here T cells are proliferating, B cells are proliferating, T regulatory cells are prolifer proliferating, and NK cells are proliferating. Also, the T cell, you can see, has a T cell receptor. We have our variable alpha and constant alpha. We have our variable beta and constant beta of our T cell receptor. And we have an antigen-presenting cell, which has an alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1, beta-2 on its MHC2. And normally, they would bind and then release, but we have a superantigen on this one, which will artificially hold them together. And that's going to cause a lot of T or INF gamma to be released. So interferon gamma is going to come from that. The T cell itself can make interferon gamma. And also, this natural killer cell can make interferon gamma. So there's lots of interferon gamma coming around. And the type 1 macrophage also likes to secrete interleukin-12 over to the natural killer cell, just like it was secreting it to the T helper cell. So when it secretes it, it goes everywhere. It doesn't just send it to one cell, but these are some of the cells that like to pick it up. We can also see that some of this interferon gamma is going down to the B cell, which we mentioned earlier, and the B cell, when it receives that, is going to do a heavy chain class switch, and instead of making IgM, it's going to make IgG1 and IgG3, which will go and help the classical complement system pathway. And up here, we saw IgG1 and IgG3 bound to a bacteria. So it's working. Great. We're very happy to see that. If we zoom in here, we can see that there is a CD8 T cell that also makes interferon gamma. So everybody likes to make interferon gamma. And this CD8 cell is bound to, we're going to say this is a skin cell that's been infected by viruses or something. And if we look down, we can see there's some receptors there. The skin cell has an MHC class 1 and an ICAM, and the CD8 T cell has a toll-like, not, not toll-like receptor, a T cell receptor, and LFA1 and CD8. And so they're all bound together, and then the CD8 cell knows that it's okay to go ahead and try and kill this cell. So it's going to do that by releasing perforin and granzymes that are going to go over here and kill that skin cell that's infected and hopefully save the day. So this was the classical system for activating a macrophage that will create a type 1 macrophage. We'll do a big overhead shot. And hopefully that was interesting and you got a good review of your cytokines. In the next video, we're going to look at the type 2 or alternate activation pathway for macrophages to make the M2 type.